Hi, good day. This is uh, Dr. Palata and welcome to our part two of our lecture on uh, zoonotic infection and fever of unknown origin. Okay, I will uh, quickly share my screen with you. Okay, so this part two will actually deal with uh, viral zoonosis and I will just touch a bit on uh, on uh, I will just touch a bit on uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Okay. So most viral zoonosis require blood sucking arthropod. And uh, among the arthropod that we have, we have two major categories. We have the tick in one side and we have mosquitoes and sunflies in another group because mosquitoes are, and sunflies are what we call insecta. So you can see uh, the difference here. You see here a, an example of a hard tick. This is a hard tick. And uh, here you have uh, mosquitoes and Aedes and Culex, uh, the two major ones that are involved in, uh, they are involved in the transmission of uh, viral zoonotic infections. And here we have a sunfly. This is how a sunfly looks like. So those are major vectors that are involved in the transmission of a viral uh, zoonosis or zoonotic infections. Now, how does the transmission happen? The first thing is that the, that arthropod vector will become infected when it feeds the blood of an infected animal. So you have an infected animal that becomes viremic, then you have uh, either a sunflower, a mosquito, or a, a, a tick that will come to bite that animal and from there the, the vector becomes infected then the virus will replicate actually in the tissue of the arthropod then it will move until to reach the salivary gland of that arthropod so finally the arthropod then will transmit the virus to a new susceptible host in this case it's then a, a human host when it injects that infective salivary fluid um, while taking a blood meal. So that is how the transmission takes place. So you need three things. You need uh, that uh, animal, infected animal uh, that carries the virus. Then you have a vector that is mainly the arthropod that will bite the infected animal first, then take the germ and infect the human host. And from there, the human host becomes infected. But please bear in mind that uh, arthropod, um, there is one risk factor that is associated to this. Some of the arthropods, mainly the tick, can be carried by the bird. You know, it can be wild bird or domesticated bird. Sometimes they can carry the arthropod. And here you can see on this slide that you have the wild bird that are flying long distances. They can even move around continents. They can, uh, you know, travel long distances. And here you can see this bird here, it's carrying a tick. This is a hard tick. And in this project, when the tick were removed from this bird, you can see they were full of them and they were, you know, carrying different pathogens or microorganisms. So then if uh, you, are, uh, you are victim of a tick bite, so uh, you will be then uh, infected and the tick will transmit the infection into a human host. So the birds are playing also a major role in carrying the arthropod or other vector 
moving around long distances to allow the transmission of infection. Now, in terms of manifestations of viral zoonosis, we have, uh, we classify the way they manifest clinically in a clinical setting. We put them in uh, three broad categories. We have uh, some viruses, zoonotic viruses. They cause um, diseases and those diseases don't manifest. There is no uh, clinical presentation. So you don't see any illness. There is nothing visible, you know. And some can only cause uh, non-specific viral syndrome. Um, it might look like, a, you know, a flu-like uh, symptoms, you know. But then we have others that are able to cause severe illnesses. And we will focus on those who will cause severe illnesses, like you know, viral hemorrhagic fevers, encephalitis, and another group that we broadly call emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. And we have the last group of rare zoonotic infections. Now, let's look at very quickly viral hemorrhagic fevers. So viral hemorrhagic fevers are a group of febrile illnesses caused by RNA viruses that are from several viral families. So it's not like one single viral families. They can come from several you know, viral families. And all of them are RNA viruses. And um, they have, they, all of them, all viral hemorrhagic fevers cause special problems for public health, you know, uh, services, because they all uh, have epidemic potential. So they all have the potential to cause epidemic diseases. And they, most of them have high case fatality rate. So it means that they can result in uh, high mortality or uh, uh, morbidity can be very high. And, uh, and there are challenges in terms of their management, you know. So they, we don't have a specific treatment. You know, the treatment might be non-specific and uh, we rely on uh, infection prevention and control measures to contain their prevention, uh, their transmissions, you know, except for some few uh, like uh, what we call arena virus, you know, um, we spoke about arena virus, new arena virus in the first part of this lecture, where we can use uh, ribavirin as a specific treatment against that. So uh, there are viral hemorrhagic fevers that are transmitted by mosquitoes, and an example here is a yellow fever and a rift valley fever and dengue fever. So those are VHF that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And we also have VHF that are transmitted by tick. And an example of those include your Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, you know, and what you should remember that Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is not only found in Africa. You know, we have cases of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever also outside the African continent. And we have viral hemorrhagic fever that are transmitted by rodent. And an example here, we have Lassa fever and the Lujo, you know, Lujo virus fever. Remember the new RNA virus that we discussed about in part one, it was named Lujo, you know, Lujo that stand for Lusaka and Johannesburg because the woman that we discuss the case in our lecture one, in part one of our lecture, came from uh, Lusaka, from uh, Lusaka in Zambia, and came to South Africa, then in Johannesburg. But none of these countries, the two countries, either Zambia or South Africa, wanted to take the responsibility of that virus. So scientists decided to name that virus Lujo, that stands for Lusaka and Johannesburg, you know, so they can share the responsibility of this virus. And uh, we have viral hemorrhagic fevers with speculated or recently confirmed reservoirs. So we have Ebola and Maba. You know, initially they have, we had a lot of problems in finding 
what are the true reservoirs for those viruses, but now we know that the fruit bats are responsible for causing uh, those infections. So let's just look at a bit of uh, Ebola, you know, the virus reservoir for Ebola, we all we, we say that, you know, the virus maintains itself inside a fruit bat. And the bat then spread the virus during its migration. So when it's moving around, it can spread the virus. And uh, we have primates, you know, uh, infected fruit bat will enter in direct or indirect contact with uh, animals, you know, mainly the primates like gorilla, chimpanzees, monkeys, you know, they will be infected. And from there, uh, if you have uh, someone going to the forest for hunting, he can then come into contact with animals or maybe after killing an animal, bring it back to the village or in the city. Then from there, while handling, you know, the animals, they can come into contact with the blood of the animals, then the human become infected. Then from there, the infection will move uh, from uh, one human host into another human being. And we have then uh, a major outbreak or an epidemic into the city. And the MABA, transmission from MABA, it's almost um, the same as with Ebola, but it's the fruit bats are involved, but it's a different species, you know, different type of fruit bats. And those type of fruit bats, actually, um, what we call uh, Rousetus species, those are able to sleep during the day in the caves or in the mine. So we found them mainly in the mines, in the caves. So they have a characteristic of sleeping during the day. So they sleep during the day. And when miners go into the mine, into the cave, then they will become awake. Suddenly, they try to move out of the caves and they spread the virus. So then uh, people there will then become exposed and infected. Then from there, when uh, the miners will come home, then you have uh, a human to human transmission. and we then have an epidemic. So this is what we, we see. So how does the virus then come into the healthcare facilities? It's through an infected person. So one of the infected person from the community will then come into the hospital setting. And um, don't always, when you hear about viral hemorrhagic fever, to see complications like a, a person coming, bleeding, and so on with a high fever and bleeding. So sometimes you don't see those kind of complications. And in fact, in many cases, outside the context of an outbreak, when it's not yet established, the first patient who will come to the hospital facilities will actually come with flu-like symptoms. And you can mismanage easily that case if you don't take a correct history or you don't take, uh, you don't uh, use uh, uh, standard precautions while managing that patient. Then what will happen is that you let that patient go, you also become exposed to that patient. Then from there, you go back to the community, then the transmission will continue. Then that case probably will come back a few days later with a much more serious conditions, you know. Then they will present with a severe illnesses, high temperature, they are, then they have unexplained bleeding from mucous membrane, it can be the gum, the nose, and the skin. If you try to give an injection, they are bleeding at the site of injection, in the conjunctive, so they can maybe progress toward complication like shock, you know, and that's where we then start suspecting those cases. And when we start suspecting those cases, uh, sometimes it's late, the transmission already took place within the community. And in the healthcare facilities, when we deal with uh, cases of viral hemorrhagic fevers, those are the type of anterior that we need. We need what we call uh, a coveral, 
you know that's what we wear you have surgical hood and 95 uh, respirators you have booties you have uh, uh, we can wear two pairs of gloves we have the inner gloves and the outer gloves and we have safety goggles when we go to manage the patient of infected with viral hemorrhagic fever that's how we look like now the second group of viral um, zoonotic infections cause what we call encephalitis uh, with or without rash and arthralgia. So uh, those are arthropod born with uh, uh, mosquitoes and tick being the major vectors. So both mosquitoes and the tick are involved here. And uh, here we have uh, five viral families. You know, we have the first group are the rhabdoviridae, you know, that are responsible for a disease that we call rabies. And here the transmission is through uh, animal bite, especially we can have dog bite that cause rabies. And we have uh, another uh, family of viruses, a Flavi viridae, we have uh, Toga viridae, we have Rio viridae, and we have Bunya viridae. So those are the five viral families. If you are infected with those viruses, you can develop encephalitis uh, with or without rash and arthralgia. And you can also, so the patient will develop fever, vomiting, headache, and the signs of encephalitis. And you can also have those that are causing encephalitis only and those that cause encephalitis with or without rash and arthralgia like your toga viridae and what is causing here it can just cause you rash and arthralgia an example is chikungunya virus that only cause rash and arthralgia so you can see an example here we have this patient is a 22 year old man you know, who was infected with a chikungunya virus and he came with a high fever and headache and a severe joint pain with a morbidiform eruptions. You can see, you know, the rash in both sides of the forearms, you know, that is, and he tested positive for chikungunya during, after doing a chikungunya serology test. And another one that can cause encephalitis is Nipah uh, virus. Nipah virus is also known as a, a Japanese encephalitis. It's originated from Japan, so it is also able to, uh, to cause encephalitis. And the third group is what we call, we put under imaging and re-imaging infectious diseases. But just to define the word, an imaging infection is an infection that has never been recognized before. And this was true when we had the first uh, episode of a SARS outbreak. You know that the outbreak that we are going through now, uh, it's also caused by another virus that is also a coronavirus but SARS was uh, also a type of corona it was also caused by a different type of coronavirus that came before you know and at that time it was a brand new infection so we call it that it was an imaging infection like the Nipah virus encephalitis is also an imaging infection. And we have also specific variant of Krajfeld Jacob disease that also was defined as an imaging infection. But a re-imaging infection is an infection that has been experienced previously, but it can now reappear in a much more virulent form. Maybe you have a virus that mutated and now we have a different uh, clinical presentation that might be much more severe than the initial one. So it's a, what we call a re-imaging infections. So those are the things we see during uh, numerous uh, pandemic flu, uh, Ebola and MABA also are known to, the viruses are known to mutate and cause different kinds of, uh, of diseases, you know. And what we need to remember is that uh, uh, three out of four imaging pathogens are zoonotic. Uh, 
uh, they are zoonotic because those viruses have the ability to mutate and to change their genetic makeup. Now, let's look at SARS. SARS was, uh, you know, um, first detected in uh, SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The first case appeared in November 2002, you know, and um, that outbreak killed almost 800 people globally, including uh, uh, Canada and uh, China. And um, civet cats were seen to be involved, you know, to play a major role, you know, in the transmission of uh, that disease. And the first case starting in China, in a city called Guangdong, that's where the first case started. And uh, here you have civet cats, you know, that are involved. And the government in China at that time ordered the killing of a lot of, uh, of those civet cats. And the index case came from uh, uh, this Guangdong province, and uh, it was a medical doctor who came for a weekend. He flew to an hotel here in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, during, um, you know, a dinner at the hotel, he met with, uh, uh, he socialized with uh, some people who came from different countries, and the next morning or the next week, people go, went back to their respective countries and we started having reports from Canada, from the US, from Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam. You know, there were many cases of uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And here you can see that different continent countries were affected. And in South Africa, we had uh, one case. In South Africa, we had one case that was uh, I diagnosed on the 3rd of April 2003, and uh, unfortunately, uh, that case died. You know, unfortunately, the person died, but it was fortunate, you know, for the control of the epidemic, because when the person died, and since there were no uh, other cross transmission of the disease from that index case, so the outbreak ended. Now, the clinical manifestation of SARS. Uh, is that the incubation period is two to 10 days. Uh, occasionally, it can be 16 days, it can be longer, but usually it's two to 10 days. And the prodrome starts just like uh, flu-like symptoms. You can have fever, myalgia, headache, and diarrhea. And the fever can vary from low to high grade, you know, and then the typical respiratory phase will start then two to seven days after the prodrome. You know, then the, the person starts experiencing respiratory problem. And the early respiratory stage will include like dry, non-productive cough with uh, mild dyspnea. And uh, if you do an X-ray, a chest X-ray on this patient, it often show uh, pulmonary infiltrate, and um, and sometimes it can look like consolidation, you know, with a ground glass appearance. If you do the CT of the lung, um, after the onset of uh, infection cases, then will progress to what we call a cough variant. Uh, characterized by really a persistent intractable cough and or then the cases will progress to from a moderate to severe variant characterized by a more serious dyspnea you know that will quickly lead to respiratory failure so the person will the patient will then require intubation with uh, mechanical ventilation so um, in terms of diagnosing SARS specimen that have the highest proportion of positive SARS-associated COVID coronavirus, include your nasopharyngeal swab, aspirate or throat swab, and also in some cases it was found in stool, in patient stool. We also have serological assay like your immunofluorescence assay, ELISA and Western blot. Now, assays for culturing SARS-associated uh, coronavirus in cell lines and for its rapid detection, we can use real-time PCR 
from a clinical specimen, directly from clinical specimen. Now, in terms of management, the respiratory failure is the big deal in patients with SARS, and um, it can cause uh, morbidity, high risk uh, morbidity and mortality in 20 to 25% of cases. They will require mechanical ventilation. And some of the antiviral agents that have been used include the ribavirin or interferon, alpha or beta, and also elopinavir, ritonavir, that is a protease inhibitor, was also, uh, can also be used. And we can have uh, anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory therapies like your corticosteroid and immunoglobulin can also be used. And it's always advised to add a antimicrobial agent, you know, to because sometimes you might have uh, an underlying bacterial infection that can be associated. Now, this is SARS that was caused by a coronavirus, and now we have uh, a different coronavirus that we call COVID-19. COVID-19. Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, disease that is uh, caused another type of coronavirus. And uh, we are going to discuss this on a separate lecture. Now, in South Africa, let's look at zoonotic viruses that are specific to South Africa. In South Africa, we have what we call chikungunya virus. Chikungunya virus, uh, it's found in the rural tropical wooden savanna of the eastern Limpopo. It's found in eastern Limpopo province and in the northern KwaZulu-Natal. So that's where we can find cases of chikungunya. And the primary vector is a mosquito called the Aedes. And uh, the transmission passed through some intermediate hosts like baboons and uh, monkeys. Then from there, the human infection will then take place. So the patient will present with fever, headache, arthralgia, and the sign of encephalitis and rash. And the laboratory test will include a real-time PCR. We can also do tissue culture for viral isolation and a serological tests uh, like your ELISA. There is no specific treatment and no vaccine is available for chikungunya and mosquito control program is uh, recommended. Now, in South Africa, we also have a second viral uh, zoonotic infection. We have it, West Nile fever. West Nile fever is um, transmitted via also a mosquito called, called Culex, and they are found in uh, KwaZulu-Natal lowland. And they, those are the primary vectors. And the human infection depend on mosquito uh, acquiring the West Nile uh, virus from a wild bird. Remember, we spoke about the bird who can contribute into the, the transmission of the disease. So human are poorly viremic post-infection. And um, you know, usually the human to human transmission is not uh, much because uh, when a, a, a human host becomes infected and they, they really don't become viremic, so they don't have the viruses in their blood. So the Culex mosquito is then unable to transmit the infection from one person into another. And sometimes the infection just end from the initial person. But that patient will present again with fever, headache, arthralgia, and a sign of encephalitis. And we use real-time PCR and serological tests to make the diagnosis. Again, no specific treatment, no vaccine, and we recommend mosquito control program. Again, in South Africa, we have another viral zoonotic infection. It's Rift Valley Fever. Rift Valley Fever is a virus, you know, that belongs to the family of Bunya Viride, and uh, it causes disease in sheep, cattle, and goats, and where there is a high viremia, and from there, both Aedes and Culex mosquitoes can then play a major role in uh, biting the sheep or the cattle and transmitting infection from the animals to the human host. Okay, and uh, the human infection 
has occurred uh, mainly in the farming community or among veterinarians and abattoir personnel. That's where we found most of the cases. So if you have that person, you try to get a, a history, you will find that he might belong to that community, uh, farming community, or work, someone working in abattoir. So handling of infected animals carcasses has been contributing in the transmission of uh, these infections. So how do we suspect a patient with uh, Rift Valley Fever? A suspected case of Rift Valley Fever is defined as any person meeting one or more of the three criteria. First, a person belonging to a high risk category that comes to you with influenza-like illnesses like fever, myalgia, arthralgia, or headache. If you get a history that that person belongs to the high-risk group of farmers or a vet person or someone working in animal uh, abattoir, handling animals, presenting with flu-like symptoms and fever and arthralgia or headache, you need to suspect. Or a person belonging to a high-risk category and presenting with features of encephalitis, encephalitis or hemorrhage or hepatitis, uh, plus on, or plus or, uh, with or without fever. Or a person with unexplained encephalitis, hepatitis, or hemorrhagic illnesses residing in an area where Rift Valley fever can potentially occur. So you, you can, uh, if you find any of this, you can uh, suspect uh, Rift Valley fever infection. Now, laboratory diagnosis and uh, management. Nucleic acid is, can be detected in blood, especially in early phase of uh, infection where we can do real-time PCR, we can do uh, viral isolation, and uh, hemagglutination inhibition assay can be done uh, with ELISA test. We can measure IgM and IgG antibodies uh, of the virus. There is no specific treatment, again, and uh, early diagnosis for patient with renal failure might improve the outcome, uh, outcome because Rift Valley fever infection might lead to serious problems of renal failure. And in the healthcare settings, so we need to put infection prevention and control measures in place to avoid cross transmission of this infection. And the patients usually do not require isolation or barrier nursing because human to human transmission you know, in many cases has not yet been demonstrated, but uh, if something is uncertain, it's better we put measure in place because we, we, we don't want surprises. So no human Rift Valley fever vaccine are registered in South Africa for use in the general public. Another um, viral zoonotic infection we have in South Africa is uh, dengue fever. We have dengue fever. And uh, it's also an RNA virus that belongs to the Flaviviridae. It's found in South Africa in the KwaZulu Natal coast, and where we have Aedes aegypti, that is common there as a mosquito. And uh, those, the dengue fever has a potential for outbreak. And um, dengue of both yellow fever and dengue by importation of virus in viremic persons. So if we have, maybe we have the mosquito here, but if we have a viremic person who came maybe from another country, uh, mainly people coming from tropical regions, they are here, they, they are here, they are in KZN coast, they are viremic, then the virus can be able to contribute in a transmission of infection. You know, but if we don't have any viremic uh, index patient who came uh, outside the country, then we will not have the problem. So the characteristic symptoms of dengue are actually sudden onset of fever, headache, typically located behind the eyes, muscle and joint pain, and or rash. So this is an example of the rash you can see here on the back of this patient. This is a typical or classic presentation of the dengue fever.
lab diagnosis, the test, we can do viral isolation in cell culture, we can do nucleic acid detection by PCR, we can do viral antigen detection of specific antibody using serology tests, and um, all tests might also be negative in early stage of diseases. There is no specific treatment for dengue. And um, the treatment depends on the symptoms, you know, so we can do rehydration of the patient, you know, uh, orally or giving a fluid if the patient is too sick to be taken to the hospital. And sometimes because of uh, the patient can lose blood, then we need to do transfusion. And the WHO recommend an integrated vector control program for this. Okay, so um, this is uh, actually the end of uh, this second part of uh, our presentation on uh, on uh, uh, viral uh, zoonotic infection and um, we will continue with the third part later thank you